Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me on what is the first FIG research podcast. We're experimenting with a few different ways of trying to get the information to our clients in different ways uh, to see which ones work better for you. So please let us know if you like this podcast format. We'll keep doing more of them. But what we're here actually to discuss today uh, is the research note we published recently, the macro update for 2024 titled Lucky Seven. Now, Lucky Seven is the set phrase, of course, because I must tell you that although we're recommending uh, our clients take duration in the seven year part of the curve, it's not luck, it's analysis that leads us to that conclusion. Before we get too far in, I should sort of step back and look and see, well, what's actually happened since the last time we discussed the, macro the macroeconomic outlook I'm happy to say that actually most of the things we highlight as being the likely outcomes have come true, particularly in Australia. We highlighted the risk that uh, the market was being a little bit overenthusiastic about how soon the Reserve Bank would cut rates, and that actually we felt the Reserve Bank probably wouldn't cut rates until very late in 2024. Uh, some recent data, both in Australia and in the United States, has reinforced that, and the market pricing has moved to look much more like my expectation now, uh, which hasn't changed. We're still expecting the Reserve Bank to cut rates in Australia, uh, somewhere around November. One place there have been some unexpected developments is the United States. The US data has been materially stronger than envisaged. Uh, when we wrote in January, everyone everywhere was expecting the, the, Reserve, the Federal Reserve to be cutting rates, to be honest, by May or June. In fact, even the, the Federal Reserve themselves were envisaging multiple rate cuts across 2024. However, the United States data has just been so much stronger than we could have anticipated at the time. Uh, the most recent payrolls print, which is what the US calls their unemployment data, should there have been 303,000 extra jobs created in the month, and the unemployment rate remained a very low 3.8%. But on top of that, the fact that the most recent US uh, inflation print was 3.5%, up to 3.5%, it had been as low as 3.2%, with some nasty internal breakdowns. And you start to see why the, the market pricing for the Federal Reserve has changed significantly. Uh, that US CPI was quite concerning because what it showed was something called sticky inflation. Inflation in services in the United States never really dropped particularly far. Most of the drop in headline inflation in the United States had come about because of a really significant drop in goods prices, with goods prices actually falling in many cases. But obviously, prices can't keep falling month after month, quarter after quarter. Eventually, the goods prices stabilised. And when goods prices had previously been falling, that's that's an increase in CPI. Unfortunately, services prices never really started falling. So what you had was this sort of uh, a wave dynamic where the first wave of the big fall in goods prices came through, lowered headline inflation, and then that wave retreated back to a more normal setting. And unfortunately, services CPI never really dropped. Australia might be exposed to those same dynamics. We'll have to wait and see. We've really been running about three to six months behind the United States on most of the inflation prints for the last two or three years. Our cycle's just been that sort of six months delayed. But the result of that uh, strong US data was that market pricing for the Federal Reserve has changed dramatically from a peak of six rate cuts priced in 2024. Uh, it's now down to around one or two rate cuts priced over the course of the year. And that's caused a significant rise in US interest rates. That rise in US interest rates has caused Australian interest rates to rise also, although nowhere near as far as the United States, it must be said. And that's because the market never expected the RBA to cut rates anywhere near as dramatically as the pricing had been for the Federal Reserve. So we didn't have as many rate cuts to remove from the scenario. The market only ever expected about one or two rate cuts from us from the RBA. And at the moment, it's only more like so one over 2024, maybe a second one early in 2025 which to my mind does look much more realistic. The Australian data has been curious. It's mostly been weak. No data has been terrible, but everywhere you look, with one very big exception, everywhere you look, there is small weakness, which shows that the 2024 is just not going to be as good a year as 2023 economically. GDP hasn't been as strong. Job vacancies are weaker. Retail sales hasn't been performing terribly well. Everywhere you look, there's this hints of weakness and hints that the turning point is in the past. The one exception to that is the unemployment rate, where the Australian unemployment rate recently dropped at the February print from 4.1% down to 3.7%. That is a massive drop. And there is a reason why economists and those in the markets often call the labor force data the labor force lottery, because every so often it does show up really unexpected results. 
a lot of people in the market just don't think that that 3.7% unemployment rate is real and they expect the next unemployment rate print, which is coming out on, on Thursday, it must be said, to be noticeably higher. We agree with that up to a point. You can't just dismiss the whole result, though. It's actually far more likely, in our view, that what really happened was that you know, if the unemployment rate dropped from 4.1 down to, say, 3.9, and then you got an unusually strong sample, which meant that my little sample in the unemployment rate was only 3.7, even when the real rate out in the economy was something more like 3.9. That's the most likely outcome in our view. But even that's quite important because 3.9% is well below what the RBA was expecting, which is more like 4.2%. That does mean that the Reserve Bank probably won't be rushing to cut interest rates. We should note that the RBA has recently changed their bias. They now expect, they had previously been expecting to have to raise rates again or explicitly discussing the risk of that further rate rise every time you read their minutes or anything like that. They've recently changed to a more neutral bias. They're explicitly saying they're not sure whether there is one rate rise, rate cuts. They really don't quite know what's going to happen next. Normally when the Reserve Bank takes that sort of viewpoint, it's because they honestly don't know. And looking around the Australian economy at the present, you can sort of see why they have uh, that difficulty. There is a lot of data showing small amounts of weakness all over the place, which suggests that you might need to have a rate cut in three or six months time. There's also plenty of data showing a reasonable amount of strength, like the unemployment rate we just discussed. There is also the small fact of the tax cuts starting on the 1st of July, which will be a really significant boon to households. Households have been doing it very tough for a fair while. Those tax cuts will help defray that a little bit, as will the fact that wages growth is now positive. We talked about in the US, the fact that services prices lagged goods prices. In Australia, what we've seen is that wages growth is still fairly strong, while inflation has come down dramatically. So instead of households moving further behind each quarter, each year, actually, on average, households will receive a real an increase in their real pay and their real salary this, this year. Now, disposable income should rise. So that leaves the Reserve Bank really unsure of what they're going to do, do next. And to be honest, we're reasonably unsure too. There are, there are a lot of possible outcomes from here. Our best guess is that there is a rate cut in November, but we wouldn't be surprised if that's not precisely correct. So as part of this piece, we modelled four separate output outcomes for the Reserve Bank. Now, I've got some slides to show you on what that modelling suggested. So just give me one second and I will put those on the screen for you. If we've done this properly, everyone should now be able to see the title slide, Macro Update, April 2024, Lucky 7. A short disclaimer, I'm doing my best. I'm telling you what I can see out in the general economy. This is general advice. I do not know anything about your personal circumstances, and this should not be construed as personal advice. If you need further information, please talk to your relationship manager. So which four scenarios did we model for the Reserve Bank? The first scenario we modelled was a quite hawkish outcome where the Reserve Bank was forced to raise rates an extra time. That would be quite unexpected. I don't think there are many people in the market expecting that, uh, but it is quite plausible if inflation proves uh, unexpectedly sticky and in the unemployment rate remains around the 3.7% that was seen at the last print. Our second scenario is that the RBA might do nothing. Most things in the economy would be pretty pleasing to the RBA, as best I can tell. Inflation is dropping fairly quickly, and the gains that have been made on the labour market side are mostly being protected. There's a lot to like about the current situation, and if the RBA is relatively happy with where things are, they may well just let it develop as it stands. Our third scenario is that there might be 50 points of rate cuts, which was what the market was pricing at the time we did this modelling. So that is essentially assuming that the RBA meets the forecasts embodied in the market pricing. The final scenario, scenario four, was the RBA might cut rates aggressively. This is more along the idea of a full turning point in the economy, that the Reserve Bank would lower rates a couple of hundred basis points through neutral back out to a more stimulatory setting. The beauty of these, this modelling showed that no matter which way you cut it, the seven-year sector looked to do very, very well. Our first uh, set of results here shows that in the two extreme scenarios, that is scenario one, where there's a further rate rise, or scenario four, where there is a significant rate cut, the seven-year sector does about as well as the 10-year sector. There's no particular reason to prefer it or not prefer it. The seven-year sector holds, it own, holds its own. But it must also be said that the seven-year sector is performing well in these, uh, is performing tolerably in these extreme scenarios. And these extreme scenarios are not what I expect to happen. 
An extra rate rise would be quite unlikely. A severe turnaround into a significant rate cut cycle in the short term is also quite unlikely. What is far more likely is that is scenario two and scenario three. So let's take a closer look at those. In these scenarios where you have either the RBA doing nothing or the RBA meeting expectations of a 50 basis point rate right, uh, sorry, 50 basis points of rate cuts, you'll find that the seven year sector tends to perform better than the 10 year sector. This isn't a fluke. There is a strong analytical reasons to why this is occurring. If you look at the bond curve more generally, what you'll see is that the, sorry, the five to seven year part of the bond curve sitting out there between 2030 and 2032, that is the steepest part of the bond curve. As investors, generally speaking, you don't want to take too long an investment. People would like to be able to get their money back on it fairly quickly and easily. So investors need to be recompensed to get higher yields to convince them to take longer term duration. What we see here is that the extra reward available for extending from five years to seven years is very high. That's the steepest part of the bond curve. That means that if you're owning that seven year bond, you are getting a, an awful lot of extra reward without having to take on too much extra duration. That's why the seven year part of the bond curve performs so well in all our modeling. The final question, of course, is if we've decided to put duration into the seven year sector, how do you actually go about doing that? Our modeling was done for government bonds. It says that the seven year government bond sector is the best place on the government bond curve to buy bonds. But remember that credit bonds are also priced against the government curve. So there is a, a, a direct argument that you should be buying your credit bonds in the same part of the curve. And we can, we've highlighted some seven year bonds which do uh, fit the bill quite well in our eyes. Uh, there's a Barclays bond, uh, March 31, Adelaide Airport, April 31, Pacific Naturals, uh, National, September 31. They're all seven-year area bonds that will perform quite well in these scenarios. Of course, if the seven-year sector is the best place to take duration risk, that doesn't necessarily follow, follow that that's the best place to take credit risk. If you're lending money to a more risky company for seven years, that's quite a significant credit exposure. So what we're actually suggesting is that the best way to build a portfolio out of this is to take your duration risk in the seven year and then pa pair that with a much shorter floating rate note with, uh, of only sort of one or two years duration that has a much higher yield. That way you get to have part of your portfolio providing quite a significant running yield and another part of your portfolio providing the duration protection against the risk that the RBA does cut rates at some point later in the year. To fill that role of a short-term floating rate note with a much higher yield, uh, we have had bonds recently come through the FIG uh, deal system from play people like SEFT or MA Financial. Well, there are sort of an ongoing number of RMBS deals which have that uh, combination of a relatively short-term but relatively high yield without taking too much duration risk at the front of the curve, allowing you space to take duration risk at the 70 part of the curve. So thank you very much for listening to me today. I hope you now understand why we think the seven-year part of the curve is the right place to be taking duration inside your bond portfolio. And if you'd like to talk to someone further about this, please feel free to contact your relationship manager. Thank you very much, everybody.